Today we're going to talk about diseases of the nervous system and the sense organs. This corresponds to chapters 6, 7, and 8 in your ICD-10 CM codebook. If we think of the nervous system as the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, I've written down here some examples of diagnoses you might see in each of those systems. Anything that has to do with the brain and the spinal cord is going to come under the central nervous system and all other neural elements in the body fall under the peripheral nervous system. This includes the autonomic nervous system, which is that part of our body's uh, regulating systems that controls the activity of the cardiac muscle, the smooth muscle, which is your GI tract, and the glands. first diagnosis we'll look at is poliovirus encephalitis. I have a note here that you can code poliovirus um, as poliomyelitis. It's a little bit easier to find that code. And there's your pathway on the right. You can also see that you could find under encephalitis a subterm of due to polio, and that would give you your manifestation code. In the coding conventions in the front of the book, there's an etiology and manifestation convention which tells us to code first the etiology or the cause of the manifestation and then you would also code the manifestation. You need two codes when you have an etiology and manifestation situation. And these, these two would come into that category. And there's your pathway. I will make reference once to let you know that down the very bottom of this slide, if we are recording this in 2016, that is where the exercise is found in your coding handbook. Future editions of the coding handbook, handbook may not be the exact same exercise, but it's still valuable to look at the diagnoses and find those pathways. Epilepsy is one of those diagnoses in which we need a confirmation from the physician before we code it. HIV is another one, and there's a few others that we'll learn about going through the code book. The reason why f uh, that is important for epilepsy is because it can have serious legal and personal implications for the patient if they are given that diagnosis and they don't have it. So it's really important that the CODA be aware of those conditions that we need absolute certainty from the physician that the patient has that condition before we code it. Alzheimer's disease with delirium is coded this way, but I wanted to talk about this one a little bit more because the coding handbook gave the only answer as G30.9. And I mention it because from all my years of reading medical records, I've not seen Alzheimer's disease given as a diagnosis without mention of any kind of dementia. So I bring this to your, your attention because it may be that you will see it and it may be where you're coding. That's a common thing that you're going to see. I would check with the other coders who've worked there for a while just to make sure. And the reason why it gets my attention is because when we look up this code in the alphabetical index and in the tabular, we don't see it standing alone. We see instructional notes that tell us to use an additional code to identify any dementia with behavioral disturbance without, and we find under that FO2 category, code first the physiological condition, implying that there's two codes. We also code the delirium because delirium is a separate diagnosis from the Alzheimer's disease and gets a separate code. If you have any questions about that, we can talk about it more, but I just wanted you to be aware of the situation where you have an etiology and a manifestation code, which in this case Alzheimer's disease has, and how you might question that if you're not given any guidelines from your physician as to how you might code it. There are coding guidelines that are specific to certain codes, and that is true in this case for G81 and subcategories G83.1, 0.2, and 0.3. And this is determining a person's dominant or non-dominant side. When any information is not available regarding whether the affected side is dominant or non-dominant, there is a classification 
um, it tells us to code it this way. If your patient is ambidextrous, meaning they really don't have a dominance, they are equally good with their right and their left hand, your default is dominant. If your left side is affected, the default is non-dominant, and if the right side is affected, the default is dominant, because the majority of our population is right-hand dominant. Although in my family, it's about half and half, so I'm sure that's true for many of you. But this is how it is in the guidelines, so that if we don't have that information and we need to be able to code the dominant side, this is the guideline we're going to follow. I also bring up hemiplegia and CVAs, or cardiovascular accidents, because hemiplegia is not inherent, meaning not everybody that has a stroke has this left-sided weakness or paralysis, or right-sided weakness or paralysis. So the code from category G89 is assigned as an additional code when you have a situation that the patient has had a stroke and does have the hemiplegia. We code the hemiplegia even if it has resolved without treatment by the time the patient is discharged. Oftentimes that's what happens. It does get better on its own. So here's a case of a stroke with left-sided weakness and the left-sided weakness we understand that to be hemiplegia. So we look up our CVA or cere cerebrovascular accident and that gives us the I63.9 code the hemiplegia G81.9, and it, this diagnostic statement we have does not tell us if the affected side is dominant or non-dominant. So we have to go to the coding guideline that directs us how we would code this situation. The left side is affected in this particular statement, so we are going to say the default is non-dominant, and that gives us a fifth character of four to complete our code. Autonomic dysreflexia affects spinal cord injured patients and it is part of the teaching that goes into the rehab of a patient with a spinal cord injury so they understand how to take care of themselves after they've had this kind of injury. It is caused by different things but in this case our diagnostic statement tells us it is caused by fecal impaction. So when we look up the dysreflexia autonomic we get the G90.4 code, and we go to that code in the tabular. There's an instructional note that tells us to use additional code to identify the cause, which in this case, our diagnostic statement has told us it's due to the fecal impaction, and that takes us to the K56.41 code. Don't forget to also code the hypertension because that is uh, a diagnosis that's been given to us in the statement. I have a link here if you have more um, curiosity about dysreflexia and how it occurs and why it occurs, I encourage you to go to this link. The next diagnosis is chronic pain due to trauma. This particular exercise is not in the coding handbook, but I think it's important to understand how we apply the guidelines. Sometimes you're applying more than one when you're working with these codes. In this particular diagnosis, the patient is at a clinic and is being treated for severe chronic back pain in the lumbar region due to trauma. And he's going to get an injection of steroid into the spinal canal to help with that pain. I've reversed the um, format we're used to here because there were so many guidelines. So the pathway is just under the diagnostic statement on the left and then the guidelines on the right. Under the pathways in the left-hand column, under excludes two, you're going to see that we can use a more specific code that tells the reader where the pain is. The G89.21 code is a chronic pain code. It does not tell the reader where the pain is. So it is appropriate in this case to code that lumbar pain as well as the chronic pain because the two of them together tell the full story. The G89 code is your chronic code and then the pain in the lumbar region tells the reader where the pain is, so you need both. As a reminder, excludes two notes mean you could use both of those codes together. If this were an excludes one note, you would have to choose which one of the two you were going to report. The three guidelines I used in the assignment of this code are located here in the right-hand column. When pain management is the reason for the encounter, which is what is true in this case, the patient is coming to the clinic, 
to get a steroid injection into the spinal canal to help with the pain. So the G89 code is going to be first. The next guideline just gives us permission to use codes from other chapters to tell the full story. In this case, we use the M54.5 code. And the last guideline tells us how we might sequence these codes. If pain management is the reason for the visit or the encounter, it's going to go first followed by the site. But if the patient were in the hospital for any other reason but still had this chronic pain at the lumbar region, you're going to code the site first and then the chronic pain code. So it's really important that you look at these guidelines and remember them when you're coding a situation like that because you may remember the first two in this case. Say someone comes in with an appendectomy and you forget and you put them, um, you sequence them with the chronic pain code first. Well, in this case with an appendectomy, the appendicitis would be your first code, not the chronic pain. And under the appendectomy or appendicitis code, you would have the lumbar pain and then you would have the chronic pain. So it's really important that we know the coding guidelines for sequencing our codes. Glaucoma is one of those diagnoses that has different characters for laterality. Some have right, some have left, some have bilateral eyes, and some don't even have a laterality code. So it's important to always look for that when you are looking at all the characters that are needed to complete a code. In the 2016 Coding Handbook, there is a Table 18.1 that has these guidelines in future editions of the Coding Handbook. It may not be on page 218, but it should be in this chapter that discusses glaucoma. And this, in this table, the author has added more information that includes the laterality and just helping us to understand how these codes are assigned. Also in the Chapter 7 Coding Guidelines, there are specific guidelines that tell us how we assign the glaucoma code when the stage changes during the patient's admission. For example, if they come in at a stage 2 and they go to a stage 4 and then they come back to a stage 2 by the time they leave the hospital, you're only going to assign the code for the highest stage. So in the case I just gave you, it would be stage 4. Also with your 7th characters, there are differences between a 7th character of 4 and a 7th character of 0. The 4 is indeterminate, meaning the physician cannot make a decision of what stage the glaucoma is. That is different than there being no documentation regarding the stage. When there's no documentation, you're going to be um, adding a 7th character of, fix that, the 7th character of 0 when there's no documentation. Secondary glaucoma is, uh, you can have this when you have an infection in the eye, or in this case, we have a posterior dislocation of the lens. And I've given you the pathways there. And you see that when you look up glaucoma, in, there is a dislocation subterm, and it refers the coder to glaucoma secondary. So when we go to that classification, it takes us to H40.5 dash. We look up the H40.5 dash in the tabular and we find an instructional note to code also underlying eye disorder, which we know is the dislocation. So I have the pathway there for the dislocation. I've also walked you through how you are going to choose your characters. It's the right eye for the glaucoma, so the fifth character is one. There is no sixth character, so the placeholder X has to be used, and because there is no indication of a stage, the seventh character is zero. Now let's look at some codes affecting the ear, or the mastoid process. Perforation of the tympanic membrane. The case we've been given here, this is a chronic uh, ear infection of the right ear, and it's caused a perforation of the tympanic membrane. And I walk you through here on the right, the pathway, following closely your instructional notes and showing you how I assigned the sixth character. Please read all the guidelines in chapters 
uh, 6 and 7. Chapter 8 does not have any guidelines. They've reserved that for future expansion. So you just have chapters 6 and 7.